What a wonderful truth that God repays men's works. It's a wonderful truth because it's the work of Christ that has been repaid for us that are putting our faith and our trust in him. But the fact that God repays men's works is a reason for unbelievers to be putting their faith and trust in Jesus. And we know what that final payment was to Jesus in his death on the cross, but also in his resurrection from the dead and his ascension to the right hand of God the Father. If you turn with me now in your Bibles to 2 Peter, we'll be reading from 2 Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> As we, uh, we begin uh, a new letter, we closed two weeks ago, uh, finishing up with a short explanation of the letters of the New Testament, uh, noting that there are, uh, 20, um, are 27 books in the New Testament, 20 of which are letters, and in some of the books of the New Testament, like the book of Acts, there are letters. The book of Revelation also has seven letters. Uh, and this is one of the ways in which uh, the gospel was communicated. God's people were no longer going to Jerusalem for their annual pilgrimages. The, the gospel began in Jerusalem in the book of Acts and is now going to the ends of the earth. And we are very thankful for the providential preservation of the word of God um, that has been entrusted to the church and uh, through the work of the Holy Spirit. Today we'll be looking at what Paul calls in verse 4, precious and magnificent promises. And we'll be looking at and focusing on two of those uh, promises in particular. They are promises that Peter goes on to uh, talk about, especially in chapter 3. Uh, but the first one being the uh, perfection of the soul at death, which we mentioned in our catechism question this morning. And the second is the precious and magnificent promise and the glorification as we await the new heavens and the new earth. So I'll be reading from 2 Peter. I'll be reading the entire chapter, and I also recommend as we begin a new book that uh, in the week ahead you spend your time in your, your personal devotions, your family devotions, uh, reading through this letter a couple of times at least. It's only three chapters, so it's relatively short. Um, so I'll be reading verses 1 through 21, uh, and part of that is because the, the reading of Scripture is uh, part of our, our worship, so it's very important that that is a part of how we worship the Lord. Hear the living word of the living God. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now for this very reason also applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence knowledge, and in your knowledge self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you, for as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth which is present with you. I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure you will be able to call these things to mind." 
For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain." So we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well, to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you how your spirit moved the Apostle Peter to write down your will and this second letter. We thank you so very much again, Father, for your son. And thank you, Jesus, for your ascension. You're having all authority into heaven and on earth. We thank you for the Apostle Peter and how you, Jesus, chose him to be an eyewitness. And we thank you that one of the things that Peter witnessed are the things he's talking about, glorification. He, it, he witnessed uh, your resurrection. He witnessed with his own eyes your going up into heaven. And we thank you as Peter was coming to the end of his earthly life, uh, the hope and the joy that he had that he was going to be uh, with his Lord again. And we pray now that your word and spirit would fill us as, with these things as Peter wrote as a reminder to the church in the first century, but also for us today. And uh, we pray that you'd use it so that we might grow in our faith, hope, and love, and also encouraging one another in these things. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Peter is nearing his imminent laying aside of his earthly dwelling, and he is now writing a letter as a reminder. In fact, three times in verses 12, 13, and 15, Peter refers to the fact that, you know, um, and I think this is echoing his three denials of Jesus. I think it perhaps echoes uh, Jesus' three questions. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And Peter is saying, I remind, I'm reminding, I am reminding you. Look with me at our text in verse 12. Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things. Uh, verse 13 of our text, I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder. The third time in verse 15 of our text, and I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, you will be able to call these things to mind. So in this reminder that Peter is giving to the church at the very end of his earthly life, Peter is not only reminding, but he also is remembering. Peter is remembering his following of Jesus. Remembering, or rem remembrance, remember, is part of the, the fourth commandment. So we can also understand this in light of the law of God, the, the remembrance of God's works of creation and redemption. And, and Second Peter is all about the, the creation and its passing away, but also the, the new creation and the new heavens and the new earth. So remembrance is rooted um, in the, the law of God. Peter is remembering. So he's, he's remembering. He's remembering certainly when Jesus first called him to himself. And when Jesus came to the Sea of Galilee and he said to Peter and his brother Andrew, follow me. And now some 30 years later, after Peter had been fishing on the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus said to Peter, I will make you fishers of men. Think about how far Peter has come in the Lord Jesus Christ 30 years later, uh, where he's not fishing on the small Sea of Galilee. It's the, the, the whole Roman Empire. I will make you fishers of men. And, and that is continuing to this day. Uh, so that the pond is the Roman Empire, as it were. Follow me, Peter. And Peter is looking back. He is remembering. Uh, we are to be remembering. We are to be hearing that invitation today if you haven't started following Jesus. Do you hear Jesus inviting you as he did Peter? Follow me. 
Based on what Peter writes in this first chapter, we know that he remembers Jesus' question that he'd asked earlier, 30 years before, in Matthew 16. Who do men say that I am? And you remember that, that there were different answers. Well, some people say you're John the Baptist. Some people think you're uh, Jeremiah the prophet or Elijah or something like that. And you remember how Jesus then brought it home to Peter and the other the apostles. Who do you say that I am? And notice Peter's response 30 years later in verse 1 of our text. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And here Peter uses that same title. You are the Christ. You are the Christ. So Peter is one of the first occasions in the Gospels of, of confessing Jesus as the Christ. And now he continues to confess him. And it, it's, it's strange because we always refer to Jesus as Jesus Christ. And sometimes you might think that that was his last name. Nobody referred to Jesus Christ during his earthly ministry. Because to say Jesus is the Christ is to make a confession. And during that earthly ministry, of course, Peter did make that confession. The other disciples came to know uh, what, uh, that Jesus is the Christ. But now, 30 years later, uh, you are the Christ. It is something that the entire church has come to confess. Peter, of course, remembers that he no longer denies ever knowing Jesus, like he did three times in the courtyard as Jesus was himself on trial, ultimately on trial for our sins. Um, and in fact, he talks over and over about knowing Jesus. So he, he's, he's reminding you to know Jesus, know the Lord. Knowledge is used right throughout the, the entire first chapter. And you remember the three times, I never knew the man. I don't know Jesus. But notice, he knows Jesus. He's not ashamed of Jesus. In verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Peter, as he's reminding us, is remembering. He remembers the name Jesus gave to him. He had always been Simon Barjona in his fisherman years uh, early on in the Gospels. But notice in verse 1, Simon Peter. This is Simon the Rock. This is the name that the Lord Jesus Christ gave to Peter. Peter is now old, and he may, according to church tradition, have been crucified. And he remembers what Jesus said to him 30 years before. So he knows in verse 14, look with me at our text, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And certainly, he's remembering what Jesus said. And, and it's recorded in John's Gospel in chapter 21, when Jesus said, Truly, truly, to Peter, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this, he said, signifying but what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. And Peter is following the Lord. He's reminding us to be following the Lord. His death is imminent. It is near at hand. And Peter, we might think these are some of the, what, what can I say to the church uh, to gird them up, to, to remain steadfast? He is writing a reminder for all of us, wherever we may be at, in life, in our circumstances, and wherever we may be at in relationship to Jesus Christ. Think of all the different places Peter was at in relationship to Jesus Christ and the Gospels. Um, maybe you, you know, you haven't yet committed your life to following Jesus. Do you hear this call Jesus gives? Follow me. He gives that to you. Maybe you haven't heard or you haven't been following Jesus or you, you've been following Jesus, but you, you don't really know the scriptures. Maybe you've been following Jesus, you don't really know God. Who do you say Jesus is? Peter had followed Jesus for quite a while. Who do you say that I am? Do you know and confess Jesus as Peter teaches us in verses 1 and 2? Do you know him as your Savior 
Do you know him as the Christ? Do you know the meaning of his name? Jesus? He is the one, he is the greater Joshua who will save us from our sins. Verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. That is a reference to the deity of Jesus. He is God, called God by Peter, just like Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Do you know God? That is why he is writing so that we might know, we might draw nearer to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter was very near to drawing close to the Lord Jesus Christ, wasn't he? In the glorification, the perfection of his soul. Every follower of Jesus needs to be reminded of the seven fruits of the Spirit in verses 5 and 6, which, Lord willing, we'll be looking at in the weeks ahead. Moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. Perhaps you, like Peter, did in the Gospels or Acts. Maybe you're at a place in your life. You know, think of Galatians where you've stumbled You've stumbled in your faith. You've stumbled in your following after Jesus. You can get back up. Peter got up over and over again, and he continued to follow Jesus and to persevere. Now he's at the very end of his life and ready to begin a new chapter of his experience uh, and enjoyment of the Lord God. So maybe you are listening, and you are like Peter in verse 14, and you are coming to the very end of your life. You could be even on your deathbed. Peter isn't exactly on his deathbed, but he's going to that place, it seems the cross, um, and knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent. Maybe that's for you too, um, as the Lord Jesus made clear to Peter. Uh, And this is something that you need to be reminded of um, as well. These are precious and magnificent promises. And that's what I want to focus on today and how God has granted to us, Peter is teaching at the beginning of this reminder, he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them we may become partakers of the divine nature, which I understand is a reference to sanctification and glorification, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. So here are the magnificent promises, and that's what we'll be looking at. The perfection of the soul at death. What a wonderful thing to look forward to. And Peter's just, we don't know how close he is, he's very close to that. Jesus made that clear to him. And then there's the precious and magnificent promise of glorification, both body and soul, in the new heavens and the new earth. So when Peter is writing, as we've learned in verse 14, his death was imminent. Again, verse 14 of our text, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling, uh, if you have the ESV Bible, it's uh, laying aside of my body. Um, I think the New Revised Standard has death. Uh, The King James, the New King James, helpfully has uh, the laying aside of my tabernacle or my tent is imminent. Uh, Here, again, Peter is is nearing his, his death. He is about to experience the divine power of God personally in a way that he has never experienced beforehand. And he's experienced many things of God's divine power. He was an eyewitness to the divine glory and majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's going now to be an experience for Peter that he has never witnessed or experienced in his soul, and something that he will one day, and we also in Christ will one day experience in our body as well. It is the magnificent promise of the perfection and glorification of his soul. He is soon, and he will soon be in the presence of Jesus. Today you will be with me in paradise. He is close to that day. And it is he wants and he is reminding you and me because this is a precious and magnificent promise, a divine power at work in you and me as well. It's the same faith. It's the same Jesus. It's the same power of God, the Holy Spirit. And and there's a sense and he's writing to stir us up in this in verse 14. There's a sense of anticipation, hope, a certain hope. It, you, you get the sense, and we'll look at this, not, probably not today, but he, he talks about his death 
Um, his departure in verse 15, you should know that the Greek word there is this exodus. All right, so we'll come back to the exodus maybe in the weeks ahead. But he's anticipating like Moses. Remember Moses' request. I pray you show me your glory. Exodus 33. Peter's, he's close. This is where he's heading. It's imminent for him. And he wants to remind you and me of the glory that awaits for us. This is the one thing that we sing in the psalmist asked for in Psalm 27. One thing I have asked from the Lord and that shall I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. Peter was not only on his way into the blessed presence of Jesus, but his soul was on the point in near glorification or perfection. And that is what awaits every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Jesus returns, there is another precious and magnificent promise. Peter mentions towards the end of his letter in verse 13, if you look at 2 Peter chapter 3, in verse 13, He's talking about the passing away of this age, the heavens and the earth, they're burning away. The day of the Lord in verse 10, the new heavens and the new earth. And look at verse 13, but according to his promise, there's that promise. This is a wonderful, precious promise. We are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. We don't know when Jesus will return to judge the living and the dead but we do often have an idea of how close we are to laying aside this earthly tent, our body. So I'm, I'm almost 50 years old, and I'm probably less than 50 years away from laying aside this body and being in the blessed presence of the Lord. We could be much closer than we realize. Peter's laying aside of his earthly tent is about to happen. This is something that Jesus made clear to him. And of all the change in, is in Peter's and the Christian's life, of all the divine power that Peter had witnessed, um, one of the greatest exertions of that power uh, on behalf of Peter and, of course, of all of God's people. But for Peter, uh, it was imminent. And he wants to remind us. This is why he's writing. He's reminding us of these things. This is something he's reminding himself. This is something that he is meditating upon. Peter would be, and now he is today, of course. He is now in the, the, the blessed presence of Jesus, his soul. Uh, and there's a future day in which his body will be raised, and the, the, the dead will be raised in Christ, and our soul uh, and body will be perfected and glorified. This is something that we've never experienced, to, to be able to enjoy God perfectly. You can't enjoy as much as you enjoy the word of God and singing. It's not perfect. If it is, we'll have you come up and start presenting. We need somebody to help present. But, and as much as I love to sing, I, I do. There's a lot of perfection that needs to take place. One day that will be complete. Both your body and your soul. You'll be able to pay attention and understand the word of God. Your mind won't wander. You won't struggle as you are. And this is what Peter is looking forward to. He wants us to be as well reminded of these truths. Again, they're truths that we, we know very well. But we need to be constantly reminded of them. If you turn with me in your Bible to Matthew chapter 17. Um, <clears throat> you remember at the end of 2 Peter 1, he mentions the transfiguration. Well, you go back with me to Matthew chapter 17. If you look with me at Matthew 17 and verses 1 through 5. As you're turning uh, to Matthew 17, I, I was kind of curious uh, in my study this week, you know, how many times is Peter mentioned in the Gospels? Uh, I think he's mentioned uh, over 90, a little bit less than 100 times in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He's mentioned the most in John's Gospel over, I think it was 32 times. Very interesting to me that um, it's only in the second half of John's gospel, though, that Peter's really mentioned. He's mentioned three times, twice in chapter 1, once in John chapter 6, when G Peter, after the feeding of the 5,000, says to Jesus, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And then it's not until John chapter 12 and the washing of feet 
that Peter has mentioned, and then from John 12 to the end of John's gospel, he's mentioned about 29 times. Um, so if you're, you're not familiar with the gospels, uh, I would invite you to, and you're in for a treat, you know, go through Matthew, Mark, or Luke, or John, maybe focus on uh, Peter, where he was 30 years before, um, and to help better understand uh, what he is writing uh, as he is ready to go back into the blessed presence of Jesus. But one of the occasions, and, and one of the things of all that Peter witnessed, that he, in his last reminder, brings up is this account. And if you look at Matthew chapter 17, six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Lord, show me your glory, Moses prayed. <laughs> Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here if you wish. I will make three tabernacles here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Peter at the Mount of Transfiguration was so overwhelmed. And again, there's no perfection at this point of body or soul. He doesn't understand uh, really what he is saying. But he is so overwhelmed by the glory of God in the face of Jesus that he never wanted it to go away. Let's set up three tents. Let's set up three tabernacles. Peter doesn't want it to change. He could not imagine it being any better than that. This is it, let alone <laughs> that Jesus was going to, on his way to the cross. And in Luke's account of the transfiguration, that's what Jesus is discussing, of course, with both Moses and Elijah, is his exodus, his way to the cross. And now, 30 years later, as Peter is probably on his way to the cross. It's imminent for him. Peter is an old man. He doesn't want to set up a tent for Jesus on earth. He's realizing that that tent <laughs> is set up in the glorified Christ at the right hand of God. And he is on his way there. He will be perfected to enjoy it in a way he never did in his soul and anticipating the day in which we all will enjoy this forever, both body and soul. So Peter is ready to follow Jesus. Not on this earthly tabernacle or tent with Moses and Elijah, but this is where now he is going to go in the blessed presence of Jesus. He's reminding us because this is where we're going. This is our pilgrimage as well as we take up our cross and follow Jesus. So is it all right for a Christian to want to die? Yes. In fact, one of the people with Jesus, Elijah, you remember, he prayed, God, take my life. That was the only prayer of Elijah recorded, never answered by God. He never did die. But there does come a point in which the Christian says, I, I want to be with the Lord. Now, of course, it's wrong for us to take our lives. But there is nothing wrong in wanting Jesus to call us home to himself. It will be the greatest experience you have ever had. Because in your soul, you will be able to enjoy it perfectly and forever and you have even better things to look forward to in the new heavens and the new earth. Perhaps you are like me as you think about these glorious, majestic promises. And you enjoy the sunshine. You enjoy being outdoors. Maybe it's on the beach. Maybe it's on the soccer pitch. Maybe it's on a mountain with lots of snow. And imagine being able to enjoy God in a way that is infinitely greater than that. It, it is greater than anything in this creation you have ever enjoyed. The, the, the glory of God and the glory one day of a new heavens and a new earth. Forever. It will never go away. You know, sometimes we're like, Peter, we don't want our lives to go away. You know, sometimes you, some people are at a point in their life where they're like, I, I don't ever want to change. I, I want to store this up in a bottle. I wish I could go back to the good old days. But the good old days are nothing. The good old days are, are what we're looking forward to. It's the good future days. This is our blessed hope. 
So what Peter could not have in the Mount of Transfiguration, in some ways, I can, I can sympathize. You know, let's stop here. This is perfect in you know, my, my estimation. Or period. This is it. We've arrived. Let's hold it here. But Peter couldn't imagine what the Lord Jesus Christ had prepared for him. And he thought it was unimaginable that it would be through suffering and through the cross. I consider it right then in verse 14 or 13 of our text in 2 Peter 1. As long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder. And I pray, and this is my prayer for you as I've been preparing, that, that this would stir you and me up. That this would be something that is exciting. That we're constantly reminding ourselves. And we are reminding one another who Jesus is, who we are, and the Lord Jesus Christ, and the divine power that is at work within us in these precious and magnificent promises that he has given to us. So as Peter, again, as we think about God's preciousness, as his, the, the magnificent promises, and Peter's death, our death, our future uh, perfection of soul, glorification of the body, what it means to enjoy God. And it's, we've never have no more sin, no more temptation, no more struggles in our thoughts, our words, or our deeds, no more hatred of the world being poured out upon us, no more run-ins with the devil and his counterfeits and his lies, a perfect government, a perfect king, a perfect priest, perfect prophet, no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. Peter is reminding us, no matter how good you may think your life is, it will end in death, but the best is yet to come. Because God has called us by his own glory and excellence, and his precious and magnificent promises mean that our future, no matter how bad your present may look, or how good, that our future is now looking better and better every day in Jesus. This is from a man who's on his way to the cross, and he's saying this to you and to me. It was with this joy that Jesus, in Hebrews 12, the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God the Father. That's why, again, I consider it right, Peter writes, as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder. I am so thankful. What a glorious reminder this is. And it's so needed. It's so needed. Because I am often thinking things are getting worse and worse. Yes, in this evil and perverse generation, that is true. And we'll get to that in the second and third chapter. But not in Christ. But you often think, right? Things are getting, I'm getting older and older. I'm getting more and more useless. Things are becoming, what used to be easier, becoming more and more difficult. There's so many changes. There's so many losses. There's so many heartaches. There's so many pains. There's so much loneliness. There's so much frustration. So many dreams and expectations that have completely been shattered. And I'll never be able to go back to the good old days, whatever those may have been for you. And you might sometimes get out your photo album, and you might go back to how things used to be in happier times. And of course, there, there's nothing wrong in taking trips down memory lane. But second, Peter is like a photo album. Peter is looking at the past, he's looking at his present, an imminent death, and he's looking at the future. And he wants us to keep focusing on the future without rejecting our current circumstances or our past. But it can be so hard to, be, uh, to look beyond our past it can be so hard to look forward to our future that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you might, if you're anything like me, sometimes wonder, will anything, will things get any better? Sometimes I even wonder about myself. Can I really change? Is it possible? That's why we need this reminder. Because there are times, and it happens in, in our lives, right? You sin. You know, and, and there's sense of omission and commission. One that stands out in my own mind uh, is a little over a week ago. It was a sin of the tongue. It's it something foolish that I said, and I was like, oh, I, forgive me, forgive me, but will I ever change? And, and I, you know, I've, I've been doing all right, I, I thought, for a while, and there's, a, there's that sin of, the t sin of the tongue. And you begin to feel like what? A big loser. 
I, I can't believe that. Will you change? Will I change? The answer is yes. That's the good news of the gospel. Did Peter change? Yes. Think of Jesus giving Simon the name Rock. And if you were to look at Peter in the Gospels, and you, now you have to call him Petros? Rock? If I were one of the disciples, I, I, you know, his brother Andrew, my brother Peter, the rock? That's what the perfect prophet calls him. Peter stumbles so many times. He stumbled at some of the most critical, important events in redemptive history. Peter thought himself unworthy, and it is true, none of us are worthy, but the worthiness doesn't come from us. It comes from the calling, God's calling of us in the Lord Jesus Christ. But you remember, Peter in his stumbling even told Jesus, depart from me. And you and I get, and we need to be reminded because we come to these places in our lives as well. It doesn't look like I'm changing. But he is writing 30 years later to remind us of the common faith that we have. We have received a faith, in verse 1, of the same kind. So there's no different faith. It's a faith that God has given to us in his grace and his sovereignty. It's a saving faith. And it is in that faith that he has given to us that same grace and peace. This is a, a, a grace that is a persevering grace in verse 2. It is a peace with God. It is a growing peace with our brothers and sisters. May it be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. He is reminding us, don't just look at your present circumstances. You need to look at your future self. You need to look at your future self in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not just looking at your future self in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's looking at your brothers and sisters. It's looking at your Christian parents, your children in the future, and looking who we are and who we, we are becoming. And we need to stop simply looking at our failings, which certainly are great, but we need to look at who we are and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. So God's divine power, according to his precious and magnificent promises, will end in perfection and glory. This is the, one of the things that helps me get through current circumstances, many failings. It helps me to look at my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I'm, I'm looking at they will be glorified. Um, and this, of course, this kind of change that Peter is talking about is not something that we can achieve in our own strength, of course. Peter tried that. Uh, he, I'll never fall away. It's not something that we can achieve in our own willpower. It's not something that the world can give to you. It's not something, and it, it, it's always something, that the devil will pathetically counterfeit. Remember the devil's pathetic counterfeit of glory when Jesus was tempted? And all the kingdoms of the world were shown to Jesus in their glory. And that pathetic counterfeit, fall down and worship me. The devil's still showing these lies and these counterfeits. Um, but no, there's something even greater. Uh, and we need to be reminded of these things. Now, a non-Christian might be sitting and listening to this. Or maybe a skeptical Christian. <laughs> And they might object to this, this hope of glory and, and say to me, yeah, Pastor Aaron, oh, my faith is in technology and science. You know, we hear this in so many different ways. Um, you know, technology and science, they're getting better and better every day. You know, it's a, it's a different kind of sanctification, isn't it? And, and there's even a, a counterfeit glorification, according to some scientists. And so look at how powerful science is. Look at my iPhone. You know, look at how powerful it, and it is. It's a wonderful thing. So yes, science and technology have made wonderful advancements. I'm very thankful for them. I, much of my sermon preparation, I'm depending on this kind of technology. But if you're sitting there skeptically as you're, you're hearing about sanctification, the divine power of God, uh, the new heavens and the new earth, um, if you're thinking I'm putting my faith 
in science and technology, you're not understanding what I or Peter, by the inspiration of God, the God, the Holy Spirit, is saying. Because if your trust is in science and technology, I can demonstrate it's futile, it's vain, just in a couple of questions. The first question is this. How is science and technology working out for Steve Jobs today? How will your faith in science and technology work out for you and your loved ones 50 years from now? It's a vain hope, ultimately. Science and technology are wonderful, but they cannot save you. People who place their faith and their trust in it, it's a misplaced faith and hope and something that is counterfeit. Peter is talking about a divine power that is at work in the world in which we live, a world in which God created in the space of six days, and a world in which the divine power of God is at work even today through Jesus Christ. And only God in Christ can bring about future glory. And he is now bringing it about. He will bring it about. He will bring it to completion. He has begun that work. He will bring it to completion with the perfection of the soul after death and the glorification of our bodies in Christ and the new heavens and the new earth. These are truly precious and magnificent promises. So finally, brothers and sisters, God's divine power and precious and magnificent promises are yours through faith in Jesus. How do I attain this? By putting your follow Jesus. They're yours for the asking. They're yours for the reaching out of the, the hand of faith, no matter how feeble it might be, and say, Jesus, save me. God's love of you in Christ, brothers and sisters, is absolutely certain. And our perfection and glorification... And it, it might be closer than we think, but it is objective. God is objectively glorious. We might even say that his glory is absolutely objective. And our glorification in Christ will be objective too. Just as our justification is objectively true and just and righteous, so will our enjoyment of God and our perfection and glorification. But it's more than that, brothers and sisters. Our glory in Christ is also subjectively true. I'm using my sanctified imagination here for this, but I imagine that if we could see, and I'm following C.S. Lewis also in this, if you could see a glorified Christian, both body and soul, you in your current imperfect state would be tempted to fall down and worship such a glorified being. People have fallen down and worshipped lesser glories like the sun and the moon and the stars. But glorification of the Christian will far exceed any glory that you now see in creation because it will be a reflection of Jesus Christ. And it will be a perfect one, complete. Everything about your body and soul in the new heavens and the new earth will not only be objectively glorious, it will be subjectively glorious and beautiful. There's a saying that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. That will be your constant subjective experience. You will feel it like you've never felt anything else before. And there won't be a single part of you that you don't perfectly love. And this forevermore will lead you to enjoy God all the more. You will be more interesting than the most interesting person that has ever lived upon the earth, apart from Jesus. Your glorification in Christ will be beautiful in the eyes of all other saints and even in all of the angelic host. So may God give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand these glorious and magnificent promises that are ours in the Lord Jesus Christ. Please pray with me. Lord, we pray that through your word and your spirit that we would indeed be stirred up as Peter was writing to stir us up uh, in our remembrance 
Uh, we thank you for the imaginations that you have given to us. We pray that in a, the sanctification of our imaginations that we uh, would meditate on, on, on the, the future, uh, our future in you, Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we marvel um, at, Father, your love for us in Jesus, uh, despite uh, our sin and our imperfections. Uh, but we thank you that that love that you have for us, Father, is certain because of your beloved Son, those same words that were spoken at the Mount of Transfiguration. Lord, we marvel that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but we now marvel that in Christ that we have been called to your glory, we have been called to your excellence. We thank you that we, through faith in Jesus, are being made partakers of the divine nature. We thank you for the continued work of God the Holy Spirit, a work you have begun and you will bring to completion. And we thank you so very much that we are on our way into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. We ask now, Jesus, that through the Spirit, you would bring these things to our minds in the days and in the weeks ahead, not only for our own personal remembrance, but for our encouragement of one another and how we look at one another, how we look at you know, people who are very close to us in Christ as we look at their own struggles and their stumblings. Uh, may we be reminded of uh, the hope of glory. And we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.